Yeah, it's good. See, now I feel pressure to share these here. I didn't realize he'd be here. Man, this is going to be fun. So, uh, <laughs> welcome, everyone, to the Graduate Online Combinatorics Colloquium. Today, we have Kevin Marshall talking about a hop monoid and set families. Before he starts talking, I want to remind everyone of our community statement. Um, so this is available on the GOCC website, but I'll just summarize our sort of three guiding principles. One, we are all learning. Two, everyone has something to contribute. And three, no one has all the answers. So um, Andres, Alex, and I will be monitoring the chat in case something comes in and Kevin doesn't see it. Otherwise, um, yeah, we're looking forward to this awesome talk. Take it away. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And, and yeah, thank, thank, I, thank everyone for I want to thank people for coming. Uh, I, want, I want to thank the, uh, the, the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kevin Marshall. Uh, I work with Jeremy Martin over at the University of Kansas. I guess here at the University of Kansas. Uh, uh, let's see who else. Um, yeah, and, 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 and if you guys have questions throughout, I get the chat open in another window here or in another screen. So I try to keep my eye on that. But uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Um, and uh, yeah, so I gave a similar talk uh, back in October at the KU Combinator Seminar. Um, but since then, I had time to expand uh, on, on some results and add yeah, some new things. So hopefully, for, for those of you who went to that talk, hopefully uh, you'll see some new stuff here that will be about as interesting, I hope. See? Um, yeah, so... Uh, so here, so so the kind of outline of what uh, I'm going to be presenting. So I'm going to start with some background information, uh, essentially covering what are hop myoids, what's an antipode, um, what approach are we going to be uh, looking at for for computing transmission free formulas for antipodes, and then from there I want to talk about uh, this hop myoid I've been working on for the last year and a half, working with for the last year and a half or so. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the sub myoids that come up, as well as, um, yeah, and, and then, then from there, we'll dive into actually computing a couple of transmission free uh, antipode formulas. And we have time at the very end. Um, I have a, a slide or two on anti matroids and, and their sub myoid. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is that they were kind of the, the thing that started this whole project. So I feel like they should be mentioned at some point. Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and get going. So what is a, a hot myoid? So uh, to get a hot myoid, we start with a, a vector species, which is just a collection of vector spaces, H bracket I for finite sets I. And, um, and, so, and, and there's also the property that if I and J are of the same cardinality, so there's a bijection between I and J, that bijection will induce a map between H bracket I and H bracket J, a isomorphism? I meant to look this up beforehand. Oh, I'm very, uh, yeah, 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 that sounds right. Uh, anyway, so we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to have, uh, to get a hot myoid structure, we're going to have two um, operations. We're going to have an associate product, which we think about as the, the merging of two objects in our vector species, and a co-associate co-product, which we think about as breaking apart the object in our vector species. And, um, and and we can do these we perform these operations over uh, over a, a set composition of I if I is our our finite set that we're working with um, and uh, just a reminder that that all set composition is is a partition of our set and we put a linear order on the blocks p one through p uh, one through p k. Um, and we can't, uh, so, so when we choose these two operations, uh, we do have this axiom of compatibility uh, that, that puts a restriction on how we choose these operations. So we can't choose them independently. Uh, and compatibility uh, gives us this notion of, of merging and breaking should be equivalent to breaking the merging in some sense. And there are a couple other axioms that, that are, are uh, Usually, I won't say trivially satisfied, but they tend to be, uh, it, it tends to be really easy to check the other axioms and be a hot myoid. Things like having a unit and a co-unit. Um, 
So, uh, but compatibility tends to be the, the action where, uh, that puts the most restriction on our, our product and co-product operations. Um, anyway, so once we start looking at the, the, the community diagrams that come out of, of all of this, uh, this thing called antipoding pops out uh, in, in, as a solution to this community diagram that involves the unit and the co-unit. And I don't have the diagram memorized off the top of my head. Uh, I haven't drawn up somewhere here in my notes, but um, anyways, we can describe the antipode as, uh, as the sum uh, that I have listed here, uh, which is uh, called Takeuchi's formula. And it's a sum over set composition speed. Um, and it turns out that, that in general, there tends to be a lot of cancellation. And so, in, so uh, which is beneficial since uh, set compositions grow with uh, sterling numbers, which uh, grow really rapidly, like factorially or something. I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, but the, the idea is that uh, one, one, of our, one of the main goals when we have a hot file is to find a cancellation free antipoding formula. Um, since the, the inter, number of sum ends in a cancellation free formula tends to be a lot smaller and um, normally uh, can tell us something about the, the hot module. Uh, yeah. So, um, so how do we go about finding cancellation free antimony formula? For that, the tool we're going to use in this talk is uh, the brain arrangement, which uh, consists of the, the it, it, and for those of you who haven't seen the brain arrangement, what we do is we take Rn and we slice it up with these hyperplanes at psi equals xj. And it turns out that um, the faces in the brain arrangement can be put in bijection with set compositions on bracket n. And we, we can kind of see that here. Here I have the diagram for R3, uh, which I borrowed from Jeremy's A24 uh, algebraic combinatorics notes. Um, and, and so we can kind of see what, uh, what this projection looks like. Um, and so the idea here is that, that we, can, we can assign, uh, when we work with Takeuchi's formula, where we're summing over set compositions, we also think about that as summing over faces in the brain arrangement. And then, you know, and, and hopefully we can get something like uh, an Euler characteristic or something that we, we know how to work with uh, to help us evaluate a, a, for, uh, a cancellation free antipoding formula. And this is actually exactly what Aguilar and Gila uh, did in their paper where they study uh, hot mo uh, a hot module on generalized prehedra, which they call GP. Uh, and, and I actually, if people are, are end up after this talk being interesting and learning more about hot violates, I, I actually really recommend this paper. They have a really good section about uh, hot violates for, for com, uh, like a, it's like a commentary in this guide for hot violates, which has a lot of really fruitful examples. Uh, so anyone who's interested in learning more about hot violates after this, uh, I, I, I definitely recommend looking at that paper. Um, anyway, so what, what uh, Aguilar and Gila do in their paper is they take Takeuchi's formula and they use some of the topology and, and geometry of the brain arrangement and they combine these two things to get a um, cancellation free antipode formula for, for GP. And then they go on and use that formula in various applications, uh, such as inversion of formal power series, looking at the group of multiplicative characters from the module, et cetera. Um, oh, and I do have listed here that main choice form sub module. And the reason for making that note is that um, here in a couple of slides, we'll see, uh, uh, here in a couple of slides, we'll see that uh, we can actually put a, a different structure on the on the vector species of matroids, uh, which is, which is uh, just indicative that that one uh, vector species can have multiple different myoid structures associated with it. Um, and uh, cool. So 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 now we, and so we're going to we're going to take a similar approach uh, in this talk. When we're, when we're finding a cancellation free antipoding formula for one of the sub modules I'm going to talk about for 
the 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 the, the small area shut family families I've been working with. So uh, I guess that kind of brings us into uh, the 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 hot file that I've been working with, which uh, I call set fam. Uh, this is a a hot file on uh, grounded set families, and, and all grounded set family is is a is a set family where we require the empty set to be in the set family. And uh, this restriction is needed so that all the axioms of, of be a hot file are satisfied. Um, but this, this restriction isn't too bad since we still have a, a lot of um, some violates that that uh, we will that that a, a lot of set families that we care about in, in common torts already include the, the empty set anyways, right? So things like simplicity complexes, matrix, lattices of order, ideals, etc. So this restriction isn't too bad. Um, so so the operations that set fam takes is uh, for product we, we're going to use join. And then for co-product, we're going to take the tensor factor of restriction and contraction, um, where restriction uh, is just we, we we're going to run through our set family and intersect with the set we're restricting to. Uh, and for uh, contraction, what we're going to do is we're going to toss out any set that um, has a non-empty intersection with the uh, set we're contracting. Um, um uh, there's a few questions in the yeah 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 so so yeah marge i see your question about uh using the subset ab uh yeah so i think i maybe on the slide show me go uh here we have a b uh that's a uh if, if, if let's say uh i's are ground set then uh a a a u the district union of a and b should be i uh so uh I, I yeah the yeah uh what we should say here e, yeah so it, uh sorry I hope that is yeah I, I feel like I, I, I shouldn't throw a note in here. I don't know why you throw that in there. Uh uh yeah I, I, all right so so what uh so A and B are are, are a disjoint, uh, yeah, they're 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 a, they're a, a, a set composition of our ground set on two blocks. Um, let me try to say here. Oh yeah, uh, I'm not blanking. Have you had your caffeine yet? Yeah. Um, Do you, do you mind if I just ask what A is? Uh, uh, a, so, 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 so the disjoint union of A and B should be our ground set. Uh, and so, so A is just, so, uh, uh we want to think about A, A and B as making up a, a set, uh, composition of our, uh, of our ground set. Um, like when I go back here, uh, when you think about this as if our if our set composition, if k was equal to two, um, these should be the two blocks that make up our 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 ground set. If that hopefully that answers the question. I so yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question then? Sure, go for it. So if we imagined that, so in is a and b proposition, right? Does that mean B is like a complement inside E. Yes. Or something yeah. Like yes. That? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That. 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 And I think. I think. Why I have. I think in my in my latex document I have where all this is written up more explicitly. I think I do use a complement. I don't remember why I I changed it uh, for this presentation, but yeah. I was, that, I was asking because there's a question from Marge in the chat asking if the the subscript on the delta in this proposition should really be a, but it sounds like right. Uh, it, so, it, so uh, for the case of uh, 
yeah, for this case, uh, for this case, I guess theoretically you could put A, but if we have more blocks in our set composition, uh, then we would want to list out what those blocks are. Yeah, that's why. So I'm, yeah, uh, because in the more general case, right, we could have like A, B, and C making up a set composition of I, and then we want A, B, and C as, um, Yeah, as our subscripts. Hopefully that clears up. Oh, okay. I see Jeremy's writing things in the chat. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions while I'm on this slide? And that is a good question. I, yeah. All right. So, um, all right. So it turns out that 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 we do get a hot modeling with these operations. Um, and, and we we and, and the nice thing, like I say, is that there are a lot of combinatorial objects that uh that uh are grounded set families, and, and a lot of these objects end up um forming some modulates uh in in set fam. So, like I said, things like simplicial complexes, matroids, or matroid independence complexes, I guess, technically mean. Yeah. Uh, anti matroids, Nazis, Warner ideals, Boolean algebras, uh, finite topological spaces. Um, I, I guess you came from the talk in October. I've expanded on this chart a bit. Um, and it seems to just keep growing with time. Um, and and so in and so I have LOI highlighted in blue here since that's kind of gonna be the 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 the, the, the biggest chunk of our uh, of uh, this talk is looking at cancellation free formula antipoding formula for the last season of order ideals. Um so uh what should I have to say about this? I don't know if I have more to say about this slide. Yeah. I yeah, just it's looking at the the, uh, the 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 image here, and I, I mean it's just clear just based off the image. So right now, what I'm seeing is that your connect your contribution is like from top to LOI. Is there like should I or should we be expecting there to be a connection between top and and matroids? Uh, mm. So in this case, no, because matroids are not necessarily enclosed under union, um, right? Or wait, mm, right? Because the, the union two independent sets is just a independent set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but I mean, but maybe there is something. But maybe, yeah, it, it does look kind of funny, right? Having that that asymmetry. Um, who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe some some modeling of. Maybe you just need to find more examples of things so that you can right make yeah. this symmetric artificially. Right. Yeah. And I think Jeremy, I just a couple of weeks ago we were talking about that a lot of the things we could add, I, I could add to this diagram, like you can get the meat and the joy of these various uh, sub modules and get more sub modules. Um, but whether or not those those some ions are interesting or something that we're that's worth looking at, uh, I haven't had a lot of time to think about. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe maybe there is something. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, I I I I do wonder that sometimes if there is a way to make this diagram nice and symmetric, if there is another some ion out there somewhere for some object that. Uh, Code is a oriented matroid, which looks like you use certain what? <laughs> I think that was Galen just plugging. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's Galen plugging. <laughs> I was just, sorry. I, I was, yeah, all I was saying is that like your concern about things not being closed under unions is a real problem, but there is a circumstance in which there is some like well behaved notion of like unions of um matroids if both of them live in the same okay uh bigger matroid and they behave nicely um it does not solve your problem i was just shamelessly plugging the union problem 
there, is another, there is another question um, that asks, what does the J of P star J of Q mean? Uh, uh, so well, I'm using star to mean join. Um, so so uh, yeah, I guess you mentioned how join works. Uh, if we have two set families, the join of those set families, we just take one set from each set family and union them together. Um, and, and so 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 when we're looking at order ideals, uh, or or last of order ideals here, if I have the disjoint union of two post sets, I, I take their last of order ideals. Uh, that ends up being equivalent to the, the join of the uh, respective order ideals of uh, each post set, each factor. Um, so. Uh, and, and, and that note, uh, that now come up when we're that comes up when we start talking about uh, looking at the cancellation free interpolation formula for for LOI, which is uh, actually uh, what I got coming up on this next slide here. Um, so so yeah, these next few slides are, are walking through uh, how we can use the brain arrangement to to find a cancellation free interpolation formula. And kind of giving an outline of the steps we take to do this. So, um, so if we if we had the P B A, uh, so we're going to P B our post set that we're going to take the the order ideals of, we're going to take the antipode of that. Um, so we're going to start with Takayuchi's formula and uh, combine like terms. Um, and when we do that, what we get is a sum over some post sets Q um, or yeah, or equivalently a sum over the last series of order ideals in those post sets. Um, and, and we get and, and when we combine like terms we end up with this coefficient C Q. Um, and and I'm the XQ being the, the fees that, that generate JQ um, or generate Q. Um, I guess generate JQ is, is more appropriate here. Um, and so a couple of questions come up here once we combine our like terms. Uh, first off, we want to figure out what these post sets Q are, if there's a, a way we can describe them. And secondly, once we know how to describe what we're summing over, can we interpret this sum CQ topologically? Um, and, and hopefully there's a way we can interpret this as any like order characteristic of some sort. And we think about uh, XQA as living on the brain arrangement. You know, is there is there a way we can describe what's going on here? Um, so, answering the first question, we have to introduce this notion of betrayal. So, so with our post set, if we have um, if we have a, a set composition phi of bracket A and A and B are 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 in our post set. Let me say that B is betrayed by A with respect to B. If A is beneath B in the in the post set, but A comes before a uh, uh, comes in an earlier block of B than B. Um, and 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 the the reasoning for the name betrayal or or betraying is that um, it it came about. Back in the day when we were all in person, I was talking to Jeremy in his office uh, about th this stuff. And we, we ended up talking about like Julius Caesar for some reason. Um, and so uh, we were there. So, so in my mind, I'm thinking about P as like a hierarchy of some sort. And then P as like who, who gets to act first. And so if you're betraying, then we have something of a lower rank acting before you. Um, and for some reason, that just, yeah, that term just seems to make sense. I don't know. This is what happens when you get Jeremy in, in the office together. Uh, well, we have some other fun games coming up. Um, anyways, so uh, so then we've got some mutation to keep track of the set of betray elements for each block of phi, as well as um, the betray elements of phi as a whole. And the reason for introducing this notion of betrayal is that when we look at what terms are generating in the uh, in the sum of the antipode, 
uh, it turns out that we can describe the, the terms as uh, these restrictions of P to the other string elements of each block of PI. Um, and so when we have we, when we have this disjoint sum of uh, induced sum post sets of P, we'll call that a, a, a fracturing. And we'll call um, and we'll call fracturing good if it shows up in our antipode formula. Um, and so to figure out what fractions are good, uh, we're going to use this thing called a conflict graph, uh, RQ, which um, we think of as, at least in my mind, that the kind of the conception I'm thinking of with, with this graph is where might potential betrayals occur. Um, and uh, the term cognitive graph actually comes from uh, like scheduling theory or something. Like if you have like a list of tasks that you have to get done, and certain tasks have to be done in a certain order. Uh, that's that's where where cognitive graphs show up uh, in the wild, I guess. Uh, I don't know too much about it, but the example I always keep in mind is like if you if in the morning you're getting dressed, you put your your shirt or your socks on in either order. When you put your shoes on, you have to do it after you put your socks on. So you can make a conflict graph for like what order you have to do things in. Uh, here we're, 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 we're kind of putting, uh, we're, we're, we're making a record of where betrayals might occur. And it turns out that um, if our conflict graph is acyclic and Q contains all atoms in P uh, for a good fracture, uh, for a fracturing Q, then Q actually is a good fracturing. Um, so, uh, so now we know what, which cues show up in the sum. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, we trailers also used by Morrison. Oh, I can put up. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw in the chat there is a mention of betrayal being used elsewhere. I don't, I don't know that's the same. I, 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 uh, example of fracturing. Uh, so for example, so the extreme example is if I have like a, if P is an anti-chain, then chain P is a Boolean algebra. So to be a good fracturing, uh, well, I guess it's a, it, there, there's only one good fracturing for, for a Boolean algebra. It's, it's the fracturing that uh, it just contains all uh right uh, okay, uh so one no, no, no. I should, I'm, I meant to work out sample beforehand and I got Jim. Uh but yeah, uh so you think about like the yeah, uh uh if, if we have an anti chain and and we get the we get the boy algebra as JP. Um then, right, then the good fracturing, then, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So your fracture would be good if you, if you can take all average and P. Uh, but since, right, since, since every, uh, since every element of P is an atom, uh, Q must contain just all, contain it, it, it just has to be P. Um, can you say what? What about just quite union change? Uh, you know what, Kevin? I feel yeah. like I'm going to derail the whole talk if I keep asking for the example. So why don't we finish and we can try and like do one on an iPad or something after the talk? Okay. Yeah, we we can try. Yeah, we 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 can try that if if we want. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, why yeah, why don't we do like after we actually get through the um that once you get through to the end of the antipode formula and then we can actually work out an example and all that fun stuff. Let's try that. Sounds like a good idea. Um but all right, so I, I and maybe maybe the idea for fracturing, uh to keep in mind is, is just what the reason we call it fracturing is if you look at the the Hasse diagram, uh what it looks like is that we're taking that and we're like breaking it apart, we're like sharing it. Uh, if, if you want like a uh, 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 yeah, at a high level of that or uh, like a conceptual level, that's what's going on.
But yeah, we can work out a more explicit example uh, here in a few slides. Cool. Um, so, all right, so we know what we're summing over. Now the question becomes, um, what uh, can, can we evaluate the, the coefficient CQ in some topological way? And so for that, um, what we're going to do is, it, if we have a good fracturing, and we have our list of betray elements, or elements that don't show up in Q, but are in P, um, V1 from PK, um, we're going to let A, so, so uh, I don't have a list here, but uh, I, I call it A a betrayal sequence. Uh, uh, this is a sequence A1 through AK, such that AI is less than BI in, in, in the original post set. And I'm going to go ahead and define uh, X and Q to be the, uh, uh, so, so and, the, uh, and the reason we call it A a betrayal sequence is that these are, this is a list of elements uh, that have the potential to betray uh, the, the elements. Uh, so, uh, what am I trying to say? So that AI has the potential to betray BI. And we'll let XAQ be the fees which generate JQ uh, and where AI betrays BI. Um, so it turns out, a, 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 and one, one consequence of this is that that we now have uh, AQ describing it. We can describe A or we describe XQ as a union uh, of of these AQs. If we if we union over all uh, betrayal sequences, and so uh, the hope is that now we can use some inclusion exclusion to uh, uh, use inclusion exclusion. To, to get um, to explicitly calculate like an Euler characteristic or something, uh, something topological on the prey arrangement, um, so we can evaluate CQ and get a closed form. Uh, and so it turns out that XQ, so so looking on the prey arrangement, uh, XQ forms a relatively open polyhedral subfan of the brain fan. Um, though XQ is not necessarily convex. Though fortunately, at same Q is convex. Um, and so, what I tell you is that XQ is the union of a whole bunch of convex things. Um, but further, any arbitrary intersection of XAQs is not empty. Um, and so, uh, what we're going to so what ends up happening is, is we can go through and what, once we replace XQ with XAQ, our formula for CQ, um, what ends up, we end up, and, and once we start, uh, work, uh, it ends up that we, we, that we end up with the like reduced Euler characteristic of a D-dimensional ball minus the Euler characteristic of the boundary of that ball. Um, for some dimension G, which uh, we'll see when we when we have the case this free exponent formula, what that exponent actually is, um, and then we then once we go through and do some inclusion exclusion, or do inclusion exclusion, um, what pops out is a uh, a case this free antipode formula, uh, where we sum over good fractions of P, and um, and, and our 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 night and the exponent on the negative one for our on the coefficient on the negative one our coefficient is just determined by the uh the number of disjoint sum of, of our good fracturing as well as uh how many betray elements there were or elements that show up in p but not q and and so um so, so the one example I, I, I always keep in mind here is, is um, like I mentioned, if, if P is an anti-chain, then what, when we take the antipode, we'll be we taking the antipode of, of a Boolean algebra. And um, it turns out that, that we'll, we'll just have one term in our sum and, and, um, 
I, mean, I like this example because it, it, it simplifies uh, why um, why can't this free formula, the benefits of a can't this free formula, where as n grows, the number of set compositions grows quickly, but for something like an anti chain, the number of terms is always going to be one. So, uh, if, I, if you think, I think about this in terms of like, if I have one algorithm to do something, it's better to have O of constant time than like O of factorial time. That's in my brain kind of the cool thing about this uh, example. Um, and, and yeah, if you, if you want, I can go through and, and we can look at, uh, we, we try to sample out of fractions. Uh, I can get my, I've got my drawing tablet here. I can get one note pulling up. Let me see. My, yeah, my desk is way too cluttered here. Uh, let me plug this in. Let me get one note booted up. Um, one note. And then, okay. So let me, uh, let's see, so I should share one note. So uh, ignore the calc three uh, stuff. Uh, does anyone see the one note? Hopefully, this awesome. Okay, so uh, let's see if I have it. Do I have any sample later on my chat document? I can pull up, otherwise, I can come up with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to do this talk on October. I had it sample later on somewhere. I can't remember what I used. Oh, well, um, so uh. Let's say, let's say P is, uh, let's see, Gary, I think you had, you had something in mind here, a disjoint union of chains. So, uh, yeah, let's, so let's see what happens. Actually, uh, I think chains are actually, uh, an example I have worked out in my, in my document at one point. Um, so let's say P is a chain. Um, I mean, we see what good fractions end up looking like. So, um, one, two, uh, uh, going up to end here. Um, so what, what does a, a good fracturing look like? So a good, um, so in this case, like a, a good fracturing, uh, just a reminder, uh, what that means is that our, uh, we contain all the atoms in P. So in this case, we know we have to contain one somehow. In one of our blocks, and then we have to. Uh, they are conflict graph has to be cyclic. Um, so if for if for change, what that what that ends up. Well, okay. So first off, J of P looks a lot like a chain, right? It's gonna be empty set one, one two. Uh, okay. I don't think we need this, but I'll have it laid around here in case. Um, so, so let's say, so what does a good fracture look like for 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 P in this case? Well, um, so so an example of a good fracture would be something like, uh, you know, like one two. Like let's say we use something like one two. I don't know. Let's say I use like I don't know five. And then maybe we do something like, so three, four, five could, could be sample. Um, and so if this were like Q1 and Q2, right? The conflict graph would look, uh, you have an arrow going, I forget which direction the arrow goes off the top of my head. Uh, think this way, right? Because you try to avoid the trail. I mean, other way, just the theory. Uh, so we have, um, so this would be like a good fracturing. A a not so uh, a a not good fracturing would be something like uh, if Q one was one three and Q two was uh, well I guess our QIs are are in two subposets sets so maybe that's not the best example. Uh, okay, well uh, I guess the second example of good fracturing. Would be you know something like if we have a one in one hand and then like 
four, five over here, and we and we're skipping elements, and we can skip elements in between. We don't care about if we can all uh, elements of P as long as we contain the abs. Uh, and we have more complicated uh, post set like. Um, I mean, this time we had something like, uh, yeah. So let's say we let's say we had anti chain, right? Could can we, uh, right? Then JP in this case would be uh, just the boolean algebra on three elements, um, and so. Uh, uh, fraction like that way is probably pretty important, uh, right? Because each contain each have one. Something. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of, uh, let me come up with an example here that that where something. Okay. So what? Uh, Oh, yeah. Does this, does this, does this example help? I, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I think I've got a better sense of what these look like. This was. Oh, okay. Uh, Q1 equals 1, 2. Um, oh, could, uh, yeah. So, uh, so I think. Uh, I guess, I, yeah, I guess you say uh, normally QI, I think of as the. Does QI have to be connecting? Uh, or not connecting. Uh, yeah, connecting. Uh, I'm. I believe when I talk, what we usually when I talk about, yeah. So usually I have. Uh, I, I guess I guess I fair put that on my slide. Um, QI is normally uh, or is uh the the Hasha component of uh key, is a Hasha component, so it's connecting all that. So uh, to answer your question, Gailey. For the anti chain one two, uh, no, that would be two separate. That Q one would be like one Q two be two. If that, yeah, that's a good question, and and yeah, I I, I forgot to put I, I forgot to actually mention that. Yeah, the QIs are the are the Hasha components of your uh, fracture. Yeah. Um. Oh. I, I, so, all right, so I guess, I, I, so uh, I guess to answer the question of why I call this a fracturing is like if we have, I don't know, some post set here, right? Wait, I'm going to try something off top of my head. All right, let's do something like this. Then, uh, one way, you know, so, so the reason I call this a fracturing is because we think about this as like breaking our, our, our Hudson diagram into multiple components. And then, like, in, it, so that you could get like uh, Q1 would be like this, and then Q2 would be like this. Right. Uh, in this case, we have a good fraction because we're, we're containing the, the atoms, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. And I should be, and it sounds like you, like, I really want to be thinking of sort of like taking like vertical slices rather than horizontal slices. Right. Can you, well, uh, I guess then. Yeah, because you want things to be connected. Yeah, because you want the Hush diagram, uh, Hush components. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Um, so, uh, how, how long do you guys normally go for? I know it's 12 50. I... We usually go until like the end of the hour. If you if you're done with stuff, we can start with questions. If you have more slides, we can keep going. Uh, I guess I'm kind of at a good stopping point. Um, I think yet section is going to take more than ten minutes. So okay. Uh, I guess I'll save that part of the talk for uh, next time then, <laughs> or for another time. Well, uh, so so I I well, let me just uh, then go ahead and just summarize what what else I've done here. So uh, the next thing I, I ended up doing after looking at this was um, back in like November and December, uh, I was looking at simplicial complexes. And it turns out that um, 
simplicial complexes. It's hard, uh, I, I had to narrow down my focus to a, a particular sub of simplicial complexes. Uh, so I look at joint closures or simplex skeletons. And it turns out that it, it, you can go through and, and, and come up with a cancellation free antipode for skeletons uh, of simplex skeletons. Um, and uh, you'll notice this formula. This formula is definitely a lot messier than LOI's formula. Um, but uh, it turns out that, that we can come up with a formula for that. Uh, and then anti matrix. Uh, the reason we're talking about these is that they, they're they're kind of the um, generalization of, of lattices of order ideals. Um, and you haven't seen the, the definition of an anti matrix. It's actually not too bad. It's a subfamily that's closer to the union and accessible. And all accessible means is that if I have a non empty set in my set family, there's something I can remove from that set to stay in my set family. Um, so uh, simplicial complexes are accessible. And they're kind of accessible to the extreme where no matter what you remove, you stay in your, your set family. Um, and it turns out that lattices and order ideals are anti matrix. Uh, so if you need a sample, keep in mind. Um, and then here I have a, an anti matrix that isn't a lattice of order ideals. So you can see that anti matrix are a larger sub -modeling. Um So my, my hope is that at some point before I graduate, I can find a way to get a case vision for anti mode formula for anti matrix using a, a similar idea. Um, and yeah, I I I I got I have a couple observations here, but nothing I I haven't I haven't really been able to make much progress on this front. So but may, maybe over summer break I'll have time to like sit down and think about these things. But yeah, otherwise that's that's what I've got. Uh hopefully uh for those of you who haven't seen Hot My Weights before, this wasn't a a a, a good introduction. Like I said. Uh, Aguilar and Gila's paper is a really good intro. If you want to learn more about hot moderates in general and the common torts side of things. So, yeah, that's what I've got. I have, I have time for questions. Great. Let's thank, uh, first, let's thank Kevin, first round. Are there questions from, yeah, you can chat. You can, uh, you can either clap with the clap react or unmute yourself. Are there questions from the audience? If there aren't immediate questions, maybe I'll ask one, um, sure. which is that, so I usually, I don't think of anti-matroids in the context of like order ideals. I usually think of them in the context of convexity in the sense that if you take right. all of these feasible sets and you take their complements. You get a common geometry and then you can describe that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, do you think that using like the geometric interpretation from Aguiar and Idea is likely to give you like so, sort of like looking at these con con convex geometries um, would be like the right place to look, or are you hoping that like there will be something that comes out of the anti matroid directly? Uh, I so I, I think I, I think I so I, I I have thought about convex geometries a bit because uh, yeah, so I I think that I think I I did play around a couple of examples of that. Uh, on some scratch paper one time because I was thinking about that because um, I guess that gives you another sub modeling of, of set fam because you, you get uh, a crowded set family that's closed on your intersection. Um, so I guess that's something I could out also add to the, the sub modeling of set fam. Uh, and, and I kind I can't get think about that because. Why was I, I think about that because, but yeah, I, I don't remember if any of my examples gave it. Yeah, I, I haven't thought too much about it, but I, but I, I do, I do remember working out an example in two at one point about with comet shaman trees. Yeah, but yeah, I haven't thought about, I thought, I haven't thought about linking that to Aguilar and Gila. Maybe I should look back at that sometime, see. Full disclosure, I haven't actually read their paper, so I don't know. Like, it might be complete nonsense. 
Um, yeah, I have to think about it. Spin watching, I, I've looked at their papers specifically. Usually I hop around in their paper when, I, when I'm writing things up. And, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe there's something that, that can be done with the climate geometry side of things and like think about these things as geometries. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for answering my question. Are there other questions from the audience? Maybe if there are no immediate questions, I will have us thank Kevin again, turn off the recording and then ask for uh, secret questions, unreported questions. Okay, so let's thank Kevin either by unmuting yourself and clapping or using the clap react. Um, clap react as well. Okay, and I am 